Welcome one, welcome all, and welcome back inside number nine. This time I'm going to give my full review and breakdown of perhaps the most experimental production Steve Pemberton and Reese Shearsmith have ever set up, and they executed it perfectly, with the exceptions of the very rare episodes of EastEnders or Coronation Street. When it comes to drama, live TV performances are extremely rare. That's because there needs to be so much attention to detail and a full cast and crew having to keep their nerve under immense pressure or else the illusion of the piece will be broken. And that pressure is a lot more difficult to manage in a horror scenario. However, due to the immense success of Inside Number 9 and the historic experience of Pemberton and Shea Smith as live performers on the stage, the BBC directly approached them and pitched to them the concept of doing a live episode of Number 9. And they absolutely lapped up the opportunity. A lot of press was put out surrounding the episode as it was and still still is a hugely uncommon style of television, one that requires a high count of balls on the set to accomplish. The date and time for a live broadcast titled Deadline were set, 10pm 28th of October 2018. Where was I at 10pm 28th of October 2018, I hear you ask? I was sitting watching Deadline along with two of my best friends, Hugh and Andy. Little did we know the following half hour we would experience would be the most groundbreakingly fourth wall shattering and memorably interactive piece of event television since Ghost Watch. The episode begins in a remarkably mundane way. An old man, Arthur Flitwick, played by Pemberton, returns back to his flat from the shops with a character bag. He pops the radio on and rummages in the bag, pulling out a mobile phone that he found on the floor of a graveyard. The phone begins to ring and there's mysterious whispering on the other end. While coddling an egg, it bursts in the microwave. After speaking with the phone owner's friend on the mobile, things start to dive into a mystery with who the person on the other end is. In the next scene, Shea Smith enters the room, playing a priest, to have a chat to Pemberton, but oh shit, the sound's gone off. We couldn't believe it, my mate grabbed the remote and checked that he hadn't muted it by accident. He turned the volume up, still nothing, turned the TV off and back on again, still nothing. The sound issue was genuine. There was some technical difficulty in the studio. The sound did manage to thankfully come back on, but we were backtracking in a panic trying to work out what context we'd missed. But when it looked all fixed, the sound went off again. Oh, Fuck, the BBC continuity announcer then comes on and apologises that the studio is experiencing technical difficulties. I was absolutely gutted because I adore number nine and I felt like I built up all the hype to my mates to watch this live broadcast and then it goes and fucks up. The announcer says that the problems are irreparable and that they have no choice but to postpone the live broadcast until a later date and instead they start showing a rerun of A Quiet Night In from series one. We were devastated, all three of us sat there in disbelief at what had just happened. They completely dropped the ball. They had a golden opportunity to create a piece of iconic television and they fucked up by no fault of their own. It's only the fault of the equipment. A quiet night in kicked in and the other lads weren't bothered with watching it, so we switched the program off and still chatted in amazement at what we'd just experienced. But then a few minutes later, one of my mates randomly checked their phone and via Twitter saw that the episode had come back on again. Honestly, we couldn't rushed to the remote quickly enough and powered the flat screen back on. Turns out, unbeknownst to us, A Quiet Night In started to glitch out, the audio distorted and the video crackled and blurred until it kicked back into random camera footage of the deadline set. The BBC announcer comes back on, saying that they're continuing to have issues with tonight's broadcast, but while she says this, creepy whispering can be heard. The announcer gets scared and we hear her scream before cutting back to CCTV and camera shots from the studio floor, seemingly being controlled. A random clip of a famous live TV broadcast going wrong where Bobby Davro, tied to a crucifix like Jesus to sing Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, falls forward and face plants the stage, nearly breaking his neck. That's so strange, cut into a clip of a live TV show going horribly wrong during a live TV show going horribly wrong. And it was at this point we all went, ah, this is it? This is exactly 
exactly what they're going for. Deadline has completely derailed, but that is the plan and was all along. We then cut to the dressing room where we see Steve and Reese out of character having a chat about how things are going. They talk completely meta about how the episode isn't even on Halloween night, despite being a Halloween special, and that they should have just broadcast a rehearsal version they filmed earlier in the day because nobody watching would know the difference. Reese logs onto Twitter to see what the gossip is about the broadcast, which then starts to show an old episode of Most Haunted. But then we go back to the studio CCTV, being moved and manipulated around, and we see the silhouette of a young girl staring at the camera halfway behind a wall. It's super startling and eerie. Back in the dressing room, Steve and Reese reference the Bobby Davro accident we saw earlier, along with multiple other famous mishaps in live TV history. The lads are told to stick BBC Two on the TV, which they do, and it shows them exactly what we are saying. We are watching Steve and Reese, watching Steve and Reese, watching Steve and Reese. It's a never ending wormhole of the broadcast Russian dolling itself. Pemberton tells Shea Smith to put out a tweet asking if they're both on BBC Two right now. Of course, my mate just had to check his phone out of curiosity, and yeah, they legit sent out that exact tweet at that exact time. We just watched Reese tweet it live, and then in my mate's bedroom on his phone, we read it. It was a phenomenal experience, and we felt so connected to the live broadcast. The broadcast then cuts to the rehearsal clip from earlier in the day, with Arthur Flitwick standing in the bath covered in blood holding a knife. At this point, the entire Arthur Flitwick story was completely overshadowed by everything derailing, that to go back to that plot was jarring in a good way, as it only added to the mesmerising sense of bafflement. What's remarkable is that the dialogue here actually fills in a huge gap, where you can legit imagine where the story went between this and what we saw earlier, even though there's about 20 minutes worth of narrative we've missed out on. That's how solid Pemberton and Shea Smith are as writers. They can add context to a scene whereby you get a stack of subtle cliff notes you can easily use to thread the needle between the two halves of the Flitwick story. But also, we get connected right back to the disrupted broadcast side of the episode with a blurry figure walking towards the camera on the rehearsal footage. We come back to see Shea Smith sitting with actress Stephanie Cole, talking cryptically about how the studio equipment makes them stronger, but who or what are them? Earlier, the BBC announcer said that there were some gremlins in the studio. Ah, there we have it. It seems that we do. Back to the dressing room where Pemberton is sitting, the TV in the background carries on from the Stephanie Cole footage we just saw, and she slits her throat with a kitchen knife. Then, on the furthest mirror to the right, we see someone walking towards Pemberton. Backstage, in the generator storage room, a mop bucket falls over on its own, right next to high voltage equipment. More stock footage is shown, talking about a burial site of over 20,000 bodies being buried beneath Granada TV studios, and a man saying that he carries a message. The implication here is that the TV studio is haunted, and whatever is haunting it has something to say. The whispering, the cryptic footage, all connecting the dots now compared to being randomly shown at first. The next camera to be hacked is Shea Smith's bike helmet camera, so the episode now switches to a POV from Reese's viewpoint. He goes backstage in the studio, hearing strange noises, and he gets locked in a caged area full of electronic equipment. The POV shot is bloody tense when he walks through the dark backstage area completely alone, and a prosthetic model of his dismembered head from the Flitwick episode is now on the floor nearby. Then Pemberton scares the shit out of him, and us too. This proper knocked us for six watching it. But then Steve gets electrocuted, and the episode cuts away to a news broadcast of a death in a TV studio, the person in question having recorded messages in the studio and picked up disturbing electronic messages. Back in the studio, Reese helplessly runs around to find help, finding Stephanie's corpse and gets shut off in the dark, now switching to night vision. Reese's head pans really quickly, but you can still see the girl wearing the dress from earlier, and the fact you can only see rushed, blurred glimpses of her is all the more terrifying. Climbing to the rafters, something jumps out and scares Reese, making him fall to his death. And we then cut to a studio interview on the one show where Steve and Reese, while doing promo for the episode, are asked if they believe in ghosts, where Reese says he's well aware they're not real, before a repeated clip of them both being shot in the head from the end of a quiet night 
night in plays on screen, cutting to the words let us be being whispered. Curtain down. Goodness gracious me, this is one of the most astoundingly bold pieces of television I've ever seen. The amount of forethought and planning that must have gone into this is staggering, and it was pulled off effortlessly. There are so many moving parts at play here where so many things could have gone wrong while being consciously aware that a lot of things are scripted to go wrong. Like with The Devil of Christmas, which I've also given a full review of on the channel, there were a lot of mistakes intentionally written into the scripts for both the dialogue and the camera shots to intentionally parody mistakes made in 70s TV shows. But here, the mistakes have to be performed and timed perfectly while still being genuinely live. There are some moments in there which give the performers some respite, such as the BBC announcer, the archive TV footage, the quiet night in repeat, etc., so that something can be shown to the viewer while everyone can get a breather and refocus on the next bit of the story. Practically everything that could possibly go wrong during a live TV special does, and in the meantime, it keeps you thoroughly hooked. However, one thing I will say is that I'm really praising the episode highly now because I'm able to reminisce on the experience of seeing it live along with other witnesses in the room that I was able to bounce off. If you weren't there watching it at the time, you simply can only imagine what it was like to have watched it live, which is both a gift and a curse. And remember my telling of the story, we only put the episode back on because my mate just so happened to check his phone and find out it was still going. If we decided to just have a chat or throw something else on to watch, we would have missed the remainder of the episode, and to this day would regret our decision. We got extremely lucky, but I can absolutely guarantee that a lot of people on that night will have switched off and never switched back on again. You can still enjoy this episode if you didn't see it originally, it's just you could never possibly experience it quite in the same way by comparison, both the gift and the curse of event television, and that's also why it's an extremely rare beast to come across. Pemberton and Shea Smith accomplished a miracle right here, and Deadline remains to be their bravest yet more successfully executed episode in terms of bringing the idea of it to life flawlessly against all the odds. And also, it's terrifying towards the end. The suspense cranks up to full gear in the final moments when we switch to night vision, which gives me vibes of The Descent when they switch to a night vision camera to scan the caves. All the stock footage used worked so brilliantly to metaphorically bridge the gaps in the moments we see with the cast and crew, as they paint a picture of the overarching theme of the episode, which is the idea that a supernatural entity has possessed the electronic equipment and wants to spread its message to the masses, and that message is simply to let us be. Deadline is a faultless tour de force and easily one of Inside Number 9's most memorable and groundbreaking episodes. But what do you think of Deadline? Did you watch it with me on the 28th of October 2018? Share your story of your experiences in the comments below and try to avoid the gremlins. If the UTG YouTube channel hasn't also been corrupted, you can check out my previous number 9 breakdowns and join me next month as I power on through the show with my full review of the rest of Series 5. I'll see you then, ghoul gang, once again, inside number 9.